Carol Pyladies meetup in San Diego. And San Diego Python. And San Diego Python. She's incredibly outspoken, does a lot of outreach around PyData and Python and Jupyter. Uh, and today she's going to be talking about um, Jupyter and friends. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for being out here. And um, I'm going to dispel the rumor. Actually, I am really introverted. I don't really particularly like speaking, except for I really like the stuff that we make. So um, I encourage you, even if you don't see yourselves as speakers, um, use this meetup as a place to do lightning talks, a place to sort of try out a talk, if you've ever thought of doing a conference talk, um, because it's a pretty low stress place to get started speaking. So if you do have an interest in it, I highly encourage you to do it. Um, so today, I'm going to go through some of the things that we've been working on at Jupiter and some of the things that are coming down the pike. Um, I am going to do a live demo at the end, so um, we will see if the gremlins curse me or not, um, but be kind. And um, So as Ben said, I am a core developer on uh, Project Jupiter, and I primarily work on Jupiter Hub in high-performance computing and large-scale deployment. Jupiter Hub is our project that lets classrooms or a group of researchers, um, instead of everybody having to download the notebook onto their system, it actually runs on a cluster somewhere. Um, and then I'm very passionate about education um, at all levels. And um, I think that's something that Jupyter brings to the table as well as Python and the rich libraries there. I am also a director of the Python Software Foundation, which basically means I help steward the language and make sure that, um, as he mentioned earlier, um, that the language is sustainable and that we're growing um, globally. And then um, Jupiter Steering Council, there are 15 members of the Jupiter community that are the governance uh, body for Jupiter and all its related projects. Um, I also have some interest in open hardware, and a long time ago I did econometric modeling, so I kind of have the stats view on things as well. And I really wish we had all of these tools and the whole Python scientific stack then. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of the projects that we have. Um, I'm going to spend the bulk of my presentation at the end doing a live demo of Jupyter Lab because I was told um, there was some interest in Jupyter Lab. Um, just out of show of hands, who has used a Jupyter notebook in any way, shape, or form? Okay, pretty probably like a good two thirds of you. Um, how many of you are from academia? Okay, about half. Um, business? How many are just here because they think coding is cool and they just want to be here? Rock on. Okay. Um, all right. So for those of you that have not looked at or had a chance to see a Jupyter notebook, um, we're going to see how well I can maneuver through my own system. Um, if you go to try.jupyter, and Jupyter is spelled with a Y, just to kind of make it confusing, Julia Python R um, is where it sort of came from. Um, if you go to try.jupyter.org, you don't have to install anything. You can try out just by clicking like the Welcome to Python Notebook, and it will um, spin up a notebook server in the cloud for you. And one of the nice things about the notebook is it lets you combine text, video, audio, code, and visualizations. So here we have um, a fairly simple uh, matplotlib program that will create some series of data and then use Pandas, which is a, a data manipulation, I guess, library in Python, and um, use that to kind of sort the data, and then um, we'll plot the data. So if we hit Shift-Enter, which is probably the most confusing part, we'll get lots of warnings, but then 
we do get a graph. And um, this is a pretty straightforward application of a Jupyter notebook. So you've got the, and for some reason my mouse is not. Um, okay, so shift enter is how you would enter it. And we'll, as the presentation goes on, um, take a look at some other additional um, notebooks. All right, so, so there is also, um, in addition to, to the Jupyter Notebook, there's also something called IPython. And IPython actually came out before the notebooks. It was uh, Fernando Perez was a grad student, and he was procrastinating on his PhD. Nobody in here would have done that, I'm sure. Um, and he basically wrote this interactive REPL, so read, evaluation, print loop, or just type a code, type some code, and then the computer spits it back to you. Um, and then you can type some more code, and it spits you back. So it's very interactive. Um, and so that was where the birth of the notebook started, was with IPython. And then years later, when Brian Granger, who I work for at Cal Poly, and Min Rag and Kelly got together, and they made this first notebook. And um, it's actually pretty good stuff. So where are we today? Um, the notebook is on, believe it or not, a 5.0 release. It's now in beta, so if you want to try out the new notebook, you can. IPython is, is chugging away through um, beta for 6.0. And then Jupyter Lab is actually really cool because the notebook has sort of been this linear um, execution of cells, if you will. And Jupyter Lab kind of breaks down that linearness and then lets you put things in different windows. So it kind of has more of a um, IDE type feel, but hopefully not as heavyweight as an IDE. And it's useful for allowing you to have multiple different graphs simultaneously or side by side. And um, we'll get through a little bit more of that in a minute. But first, I want to um, share something called IPy widgets. And we just had a release of IPy widgets. And widgets really open the door to, um, you know, it's sliders, it's pull downs. It really opens the door to making your notebooks interactive. It allows you to prototype much easier. Um, if you're a student or a, an instructor, your students can visualize a three-dimensional, um, whether it's like derivatives or volumes or things, you could change one variable and they would see the impact of it. So you could imagine like a PyDi, which is a physics dynamics library in Python, you know, the, the old, like, I've got the train going this way and the train going that way. What happens when they collide? Um, and you can also use that and combine it with SymPy, to, which is a symbolic algebra library, and actually do a series of notebooks that could actually simulate a person's body, um, the forces on the different limbs and the joints. And by the end, you can not only use the symbolic algebra to do the force equations, but also use, you know, enter data and then visualize a kind of a mock-up body actually trying to mount balance or maintain balance. And again, you could use the sliders to change what happens if the force is really strong on the upper torso or you've got very short legs or whatever it is. So um, it's actually a fun way to try different things out in science. And then we also provide a cookie cutter which allows individuals that want to code their own widgets a nice, clean kind of template to start from to do that. So what I want to do real quickly is, and I'm sorry if I'm going to make you seasick going back and forth from these things, but um, so the documentation for the widgets, and I will have these slides available on the PyData repo later this evening, 
But the documentation itself actually goes through the different widgets that are already available. And one of the cool things about the documentation is you can actually try out the widgets within the documentation. So it's not just static, which kind of gives you a sense of how they work. Um, you know, the sliders, like how do you like your eggs scrambled so you could have different choices. Um, and this becomes... Um, more interesting when this is actually part of our main jupiter.org website, and in that we have a tab which will get um, it, more widgets over time. But these are th uh, third party library widgets. Um, one is called iPy Leaflet, which lets you do some really cool um, uh, things with graphing and mapping. Um, BQ plot lets you do some scatter plots and moving around colors and shapes. And there's all examples of how to install it and um, do that. One of my favorites is um, Py3.js, which basically you can, I don't know, can you see that? Like the manipulation of the, the solid and um, their are a number of, um, with the documentation, there's more example notebooks and things. Um, another really cool project that is done by another um, developer called Martin Brettles, who is not a Jupyter Core developer, but somebody in the community, is called IPy Volume. And it is probably the coolest thing I've played with all week. So you can do, um, manipulations with the widgets, as well as manipulating the image itself. Uh, stereo, for those of you that want to work in stereo. Um, I'm not going to do full screen because I'm afraid like I will blow away my screen and not be able to get it back. Uh, again, like this is a smaller scatter. Um, but it's kind of fun because you really have some ability to do, I can't, Pinch. All right. But that's all within its documentation. So you can actually go, and I will give you the link to their documentation, and see not only the code of how they created it, but then also have an opportunity to um, play around with it and think about how it could be used in like perhaps like a genome structure or uh, a mechanical engineering structure looking at something from different angles or viewpoints. Uh, okay. Sorry for the bouncing. Um, so actually where we're going with widgets is really going beyond static documentation to give you interactive documentation. And not just interactive documentation from the standpoint of this is documentation for a library, but there are actually people authoring books using notebooks as their um, platform for um, collaboration and authoring. And you could actually have examples like this in your book readily available for people to um, use and run either on their own system or um, on the cloud. Um, and then from a researcher standpoint, it lets you do a lot of what-if analysis. Um, one of the things that I think is most powerful about the notebook is the ability to try something in a few lines of code and then change it if you don't like it, or while at the same time being able to use those notebooks to have a reproducible workflow within science or data science. Okay, and then this is just iPy volume, which we just talked about. Um, and I encourage you to kind of mess around with it and see how you might use it in your own projects. Okay, any questions on the basic notebooks, IPython, before I kind of switch gears? Yeah. Pretty amateur question. The, the widgets, do I have to be within a notebook to use those widgets, or can I use those widgets in any Python code? 
the question was, do I have to use the widgets in the notebooks or can I use it in any Python code? And I would say what you have to do is look at the documentation, but some of those widgets can in fact be used outside of the notebook. So um, it does extend beyond the notebook and into other um, websites, things like that. So you could embed them in a website if you wanted to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So um, we're going to do a very quick run through of Jupyter Hub so that I can get to the live demo and you can see how badly I wind up manipulating my own computer. But um, Jupyter Hub, like I said before, it allows you to offer a group of people notebooks without the individuals having to install it on their computer. So at Cal Poly, we teach a data science class there. And what it allows us to do is know that every student's going to have, whether they're on Mac or Linux or Windows, that they're going to start from a common web-based um, environment with the same dependencies for different libraries already pre-installed. And so it lets us dive into more the content versus troubleshooting, oh my goodness, you have the wrong version of this installed and it doesn't work quite this way on Windows as it does on Linux. And it just makes it so the first lecture is impactful and meaningful and um, the students, by the end of the semester, are actually making some really cool projects of their own with machine learning or visualizations. You know, Python's got a really rich library, and um, uh, I believe Berkeley is offering Jupyter Hub to all their freshmen are going to wind up having to take a data science class because they feel as if... Um, the ability to do simple computation on data is an important skill, much like reading, writing, um, speaking. And, um, and I don't know how much Michigan is using notebooks, but I was um, really surprised. I was at University of Illinois this past weekend, and there were about a little over 1,000 students there for a hackathon most of them had used the notebooks. A lot of them had Anaconda or Jupyter installed, which was the most that I've seen. Um, so it's been sort of a wild ride. So the architecture is pretty much, we call it the hub, and the hub really does a couple of things. It um, authenticates users, keeps a database of users and administrators, and then it spawns what we call a single user notebook server for each student or person. And again, you would interact with it through the browser and the proxy kind of is the traffic cop between um, API calls versus actual calls to an individual's um, notebook server. Uh, various different ways that you can authenticate um, from high-performance computing where they've got different um, things down to like using Google OAuth, I mean GitHub OAuth or Google OAuth, um, which gives a lot of flexibility to the environments that you can use JupyterHub. There's also um, a number of different spawners. Um, some people like to spawn their single user servers within Docker containers or use Kubernetes. Um, Berkeley uses Kubernetes extensively. Um, in the high performance computing supercomputer world, there's a lot of batch processing done. So they wanna give their researchers the ability to submit batch jobs, but then also let them do interactive stuff for when that makes sense as well. Um, so, at the end of December, we announced and introduced um, version 0 0.7. And really the big thing that this did was it set up a services model. So Jupyter Hub by its own is pretty cool. The services and the API that goes with services lets us do other things to interact with a hub. 
Um, for example, perhaps like a grading service or sharing files, potentially sharing a notebook server between groups. Um, NB Viewer is something that we use to render um, different notebooks out in the wild. And so where are we going with the release that we're currently working on? Um, a lot of it is being done, some of it's being done to give the end user or the person deploying the hub different options when it comes to a proxy. Right now, you're somewhat limited to what Nginx or um, the configurable proxy that um, we have in Node.js that um, so that's, there's going to be more of that. And that'll allow us to um, better serve uh, multiple servers per user. So each server has what we call language kernels. So I might have a server for work stuff. I might have a server for a particular research project. And it, it gives me a lot of flexibility in terms of um, the different environments that I can spin up at any given point in time. And we're also going to get rid of, right now we use some cookies that keeps track of certain user information or profile type stuff, and we're going to get rid of that because it's more of a pain. So that's more a, let's get rid of that so we can offer some more interesting things. And then HubShare is going to be something which allows us to share notebooks between users. So uh, as a professor, I could give a batch of notebooks on a particular topic. Students could pull it down. We do have something now called MB Grader that lets you do that, but this will actually um, streamline it and make it actually a lot more pleasant to install and use. So questions on Jupyter Hub? Yes. Yes. Um, I was wondering how does the binding these kind of Okay, so my, my binder, binder is actually really cool. It lets you um, actually run a notebook that you have in a repository on GitHub and submit it and people can go to that site and then um, interactively use those notebooks. Uh, Jeremy Freeman, who was at Janelli Labs, was the, um, architect of that system. He has since moved on to a different role. Uh, and so Binder right now is a little bit in flux, but the Jupyter team is very much committed to make sure that um, Binder is sustained. Um, so we've been in talks with um, Jeremy and some others. And really, the, the key thing is just getting the infrastructure people, the sysadmin type people, to keep the site running. Um, 24 seven. Um, so I don't anticipate it would go away. It's, it's pretty much a complement to what we're doing. And I think it's a, a powerful way to let people try your notebooks. So, um, if there are issues using it in this little flux time, let us know, cause we'd be happy to jump in. Cause we do have a couple people that aren't solely dedicated to it, but that are responsible for it. Good question. Yeah. Is Jupiter being an open source project? I know that they have to bring certain revenue in, and uh, there were certain topics like using uh, curated Jupiter or uh, yeah, Jupiter hubs as a service, a subscription service. It's like a paid subscription service through. Okay. So Jupiter. Project Jupiter, like if you go to jupiter.org, we are a scientific research project. We get grants like from the Sloan Foundation, the Moore Foundation, Helmsley Foundation. Um, we do have a couple industry partners like Bloomberg and Continuum Analytics who um, may give us a nominal amount of money but really more dedicate some of their developers to the scientific ecosystem. So I am paid under a research grant as is most, as are most of the developers, are either university people, postdocs, um, professors. So we don't actually sell a service. 
Now, that being said, there are other people throughout um, the world that are selling, you know, either provisioning of these services. So they're consuming open source, which is, you know, common in the Linux world and, and other parts of open source. So um, when we look at development, we look more at what's going to benefit the researchers, the scientists, the students in education, first and foremost. And then if it's not something that really falls under that umbrella, we encourage partners or other people to develop something as an adjunct too, um, which is why we try and focus more on APIs, which, um, which is like an application programming interface that just lets people talk to our projects easily and, and consume them. So, yes? You talked about the iPi widgets. Yes. I'm curious how these contrast with um, extensions. Um, Are extensions going away? I guess it's kind of one question. I see lots of energy about the widgets, but not as much on the extension side. Are I don't. I don't think they're going away. The extensions tend to more change the user interface of the notebook itself, where the widgets are usually used more within a notebook. Um, so I don't anticipate that either one is going to go away. They're just going to evolve. And um, what we're trying to do is make it so that third-party developers can develop different extensions, whether it's a, you know, an auto-grading thing or, I don't know, what are some of the other extensions we have? A git diff? Yeah, although we have a project called NB Dime that lets us do um, diffs and merges of notebooks. So, um, and we're, we're, we've been asking GitHub if they'd like to put it in their service. So we'll see where that goes. But uh, any more questions right now about Jupyter Hub? Okay, well now we get to the really fun and embarrassing part. Um, Jupyter Lab is um, our multi-windowed uh, drag and drop environment and um, it is actually something, it's in alpha right now, headed towards beta. You can actually download it, install it on your computers. The installation um, is not bad. It's one command if you're using Anaconda, two commands if you're using the pick pip package manager. So um, you should be able to get up and running, and if you can't, please go to the Jupyter Lab Gitter channel and one of the developers would be happy to walk you through how to install it because it might not be you, it might be us. Um, so again, that's the link to starting up Jupyter Lab. And now we get to the fun part, maybe the fun part. All right, all right, so much for that. All right, so when you launch Jupyter Lab, you get a screen similar to that. Can you guys see that? Or is it too small? Bigger? This is going to be a challenge because as I get bigger, I lose some of my real estate. Okay, so, okay, now this is going to throw me off by making it bigger. So now I'm going to make it smaller. Um, but I encourage you afterwards, I'd, happy, I'd be happy to stay around a little while and help you get it installed if that's what you want to do on your system. So you have a launcher here that allows you to launch um, notebooks, consoles, terminals, editors, um, a menuing system across the top, as well as menus down the side that um, you could see what is running currently, uh, file browser, um, there's many different commands. One of the nice things about it is it has got um, a context-sensitive search, so you could just type in what you think you might need, and it'll pull up stuff that's similar to that. And then again, um, another way of accessing the launcher should you have closed this initial window. So let's open a notebook and you get a pretty familiar looking, for those of you that have used Jupyter or IPython notebooks, a pretty familiar um, interface. Um, 
that's fairly linear. And now we can really see my live coding skills. Shift enter lets you, um, that's a command that um, matplotlib uses to uh, render your um, graphs in line. And we'll just plot some random things here. One of the nice things about it is we can, if my mouse cooperates, so I can actually split the um, output by grabbing it on the left-hand side and moving it there. Um, and you can imagine if you're doing multiple runs of different graphs, you could stack them up down the one side. Um, you can also, I'm going to pull up a machine learning notebook that we had sort of pre-done, which manipulates some images. What's a presentation without some cute cats? Um, and actually, we're going to take this cat, and I'm not an imaging ex expert by any means, but this person that made this actually put some widgets in it. Sigma looks like it just fuzzes or defuzzes it. Um, you know, red, green, blue, saturation of color. But what's kind of cool is, again, I can grab this side of it. And up here is going to be, let's see if I can make this a little more understandable. All right, so I'm going to get rid of the old notebook just so we have a little more space. So this was our original notebook here with cute little cat, um, cute little cat here. And can you guys see that one? So we have a mirrored output. If I slide this to fuzz the cat in the mirrored output or in the actual notebook, it will respond which is kind of nice if you're doing presentation teaching in front of a class. Um, again, like I could take the red out and it gives you um, an ability to synchronize the different outputs. Um, so we can move these around, we can synchronize it. Um, I'm going to swap, if there's no questions on this demo, go ahead. Does this mean we could do Google Docs like Shared editing of our notebooks? Uh, shared editing of the notebooks. Like real-time collaboration, that will be in the next version. Um, if you need real-time collaboration now on a particular notebook, um, we would recommend Sage Math Cloud. Um, they do a really nice job with it. Um, we do have postdocs that are actively working on real-time collaboration and there are some real-time collaboration repos already up on the Jupyter uh, site on GitHub, but um, we're, what we're trying to do is make it so that you can share the notebooks first, and then we want to make sure that when we do do collaboration, we do it well, because otherwise it will be a nightmare and a frustration to everybody. But um, so Sage Math Cloud and, and we do, they come to our developer meetings online and, and things. So um, what we're really trying to do is push science forward um, in general. Was there another question? Yeah. Uh, do you think Jupyter Lab will ever get integrated into Jupyter Hub? Do I think Jupyter Lab will ever get integrated into Jupyter Hub? Absolutely, yes. In fact, um, at Cal Poly, for the data science class, we are the second half of the semester going to use some of the Jupyter Lab stuff. Um, and really, the difference between going back and forth from lab to um, the notebook is because it's a web based, you have a server that's running the kernel. Let's see. By changing that lab in the URL to tree, it takes me back to um, 
standard Jupyter notebook interface that so it's actually pretty easy to go back and forth. Um, you have to have Jupyter Lab installed, obviously, on the hub. But um, yeah, so it will. You'll have your choice or both. Or it's pretty fun. Yeah. I sort of figured when I saw some of the early Jupyter Lab stuff that it was going to replace the regular notebooks. But this now makes me think they're going to sort of coexist. Uh, they will coexist for a while. Um, what we will probably see is it, they are two separate repos. So what we'll see is over time, less development will be focused on the notebook while it, the emphasis will be on Jupyter Lab. But we recognize that the notebook, and, and I'm a big proponent of the simple notebook because there are some ways that it engages students in a way that um, doesn't have the cognitive overhead of multi-paneled um, displays. So we would definitely have a way to have the simple notebook interface as well. Um, it's not clear to me what the timing is going to be on any of that, but it's not like all of a sudden it'll be, you'll, you'll have plenty of notice and there's no immediate plans to just say, okay, notebook, goodbye. Um, it's going to be kind of a gradual transition. And um, one of the nice things, it's, it's pretty easy to go back and forth between the two. But great question. Anything else? Want to see more Jupyter Lab? No? Okay, I'm done. No, um, I will try my best. All right, so, okay. Now we'll really see um, if I am worth anything here. OK, so uh, Markdown is a markup language that is commonly used in science. GitHub renders it. Um, we can have a Markdown editor within Jupyter Lab. I can also open this file, eh, not that one, as rendered markdown. And what's nice about that, if I can get it to go where it's supposed to go, I probably should have told you I'm actually not a front end developer. I'm the low level networking supercomputer stuff. But um, you've got the rendered on the right-hand side. In the middle is the actual code. So if I actually edited this markdown with a slight little lag, you should see it in the rendered version as well. Um, also, kind of cool, if we go into the command palette and start a console, And let me put that up there. If I went down here, and let's say we wanted to take this code and make a scatter plot, I should be able to, if the demo goddess is, is cooperating, um, be able to hit shift enter. And oh, well, there you go. It's not defined. Let's run this one first and see. But it should actually run it in the console. Oh, there it goes. So you can see it took the um, data that was in the markdown file and actually, I don't know why that is not. I need a bigger screen. That's really what I need. I need my 36 inch screen that is in my office. But it basically, it renders a pandas data frame. And now, if we try and do the scatter plot, unless I'm mistaken, there we go. And again, I could pull that scatter plot if I was. OK, what's bouncing over here? Somebody's not happy. Um, I'm going to get rid of this. All right. I think I just might have locked up my own computer. But you can render it there. You can pull it out. 
Um, I'm not going to try and figure it out. But I assure you, oh, there you go. Why is the dictionary? Okay. All right. The gremlins have found me. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, and this is actually the Jupiter hub interface. So I will take a quick detour to something I know. Um, so an administrator or an instructor would see this. You could see all the different users in your class. Um, we're working on metrics of how much memory or storage the students are taking up. We can stop servers, start servers, shut down the hub. Um, ah. And oh, man. I should have somebody else drive. And then again, the students, once they log in, they would see a green button that says start my server. And this is actually on like a small digital ocean session that I have. And um, it's just something, yeah. Can you talk about what this has done for the hardware you have to deploy in a class to support this? Um, you know, the hardware, it's going to depend on universities. Some people are using strictly like um, uh, virtual machines, cloud-based stuff. Some people, um, Cal Poly, we run on bare metal. It really depends on the university. But um, one of the nice things is uh, Microsoft has done some work with us as well. They have a notebook service in beta right now, so you could just go there. So I anticipate what will happen is you will have everything from, you know, the Googles and Microsofts of the world that are already in the education space, offering services to um, virtual machines, virtual private networks, all the way to bare metal supercomputers. So it's really going to span. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Droplet for... Do I have an installation drop droplet with it? Um, yes and no. Uh, we this particular instance is using some Ansible scripts, and I there's it, it's probably in one of my repos. Um, it is not documented, but we are working on documenting many different types of deployment. So there, are, there is a reference deployment that we have right now. Um, it just doesn't walk you through, like, let's say, how to do it on DigitalOcean or how to do it. Though, if you wanted to do it on Docker, there's a really good PyData London talk by one of my colleagues, Min Reagan Kelly, that walks you through how to deploy Jupyter Hub. So, but it's coming. All right. Back to the hard stuff, at least for me. Oh, well, look at that. While we were gone, it fixed itself. It fixed itself. Go figure. All right, so maybe it's just my computer. I, my computer is on its last leg of its fan. And All right, so I've got one more demo, and then I think... You guys are probably tired of me and probably want to get to actually doing it yourselves. Okay, really? No, yeah, okay. All right. So another cool thing that you can do is I might want to open um, a CSV file. And in this case, it's going to show me... Um, a table of data. I can also open it and um, in editor mode and have the raw data and kind of put them side by side, which is kind of nice. Um, you can also do it in things like uh, GeoJSON. So if I opened up, turn right. Where are we going? GeoJSON, it's trying to map. That's what it's trying to do. So, okay, so I have some 
I'm going to get rid of the iris data and claim a little real estate. Um, so I've got some data about museums and somewhere. And then I can also open it as um, a map. So it's pretty powerful as you're doing um, your analysis of your data or your cleaning of your data. You can run some simple visualizations and kind of say, hey, my data is making sense, or no, it's really not. Um, but this was really just to illustrate that there are different editing modes with which you can um, open it up. Um, and one of the nice things about how Jupyter Lab is architected is, let me get rid of this. It's sort of built like Lego bricks in a way. Like each um, plugin kind of has its own functionality. So there'll be plugins that we provide with Jupyter Lab, but then other individuals can make plugins as well that you could incorporate into your analysis and research. So um, it'll be both extensible as well as um, very dynamic. Uh, questions? Uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Ben, do you know? I, it's, is it the only one right now? I know it supports a number of visualization libraries. Um, that would be a great question to ask, like, on the Jupyter mailing list or on a Gitter channel. It's just not something I work with on a daily basis, so I don't really know. But... Yes, pull requests are welcome. Yes. Uh, what, uh, what instance do you guys use to exit the pixel for the, the desktop? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Jupyter Lab is built into TypeScript? Jupyter Lab yeah. has, uses a lot of TypeScript, yes. What influence did you um, I think it was probably. One of the things that's used is Phosphor.js, which was architected and built by the company that was founded by the person that made NumPy originally. And what they wanted was something that was going to be fast and optimized for large data sets and computation. And so by typing it and using TypeScript, it, there's a little bit of a performance than not having typed. And also, it lets you run tests a little more cleanly. Um, but yeah, design decision. Yeah. So Jupyter Notebook has the different language kernels. Well, does Jupyter Lab also have similar? Yes. Kernels? They actually use the same language kernels. There's about 40 something different language kernels. Um, there's the common ones like R, Julia, Python that you would be familiar with in data science. There's also Haskell, Ruby. I am currently working on one. Um, some people might have heard of the MicroPython, the little board. Um, Adafruit is actually making CircuitPython that um, uses MicroPython, but it's going to be really aimed at education and like the K through 12 space. And so I'm going to be working on making a language kernel for CircuitPython so that um, kids around the world can make lights blink and have fun and do cool things. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Any efforts at putting multiple kernels in one notebook? Multiple kernels in one notebook. I'm thinking of like with a deeper feature. Probably. Yeah. Uh, yes, there is discussion of that. Um, I'm, you'd have to, all of our roadmap materials are actually in the Jupyter governance repo. So the roadmap, I think, for the next release plus maybe half of another release or the next release after that is documented. I mean, it's subject to change, but um, 
I personally could see a use like somebody wanting to use R and Python and Julia in the same notebook. Um, using Jupyter Lab, you're going to pretty easily be able to have different kernels running with different notebooks within a window. As far as the overall one notebook with multiple kernels, I don't know. It would be a good question to ask on the mailing list. Isn't R Studio doing something like that? Uh, there are other people who have done it. No? I don't think multiple kernels in the same notebook. They might be doing it, but they may not be doing it in the same way. Yes? Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, in general, I believe that if people clamor for it, we will find a way to do it. Um, but I can't give you a time frame. Um, some other cool resources, um, pyvideo.org takes all the PyData conferences, all the PyCon conferences, SciPy, has all the tutorials and talks uh, cross-referenced uh, by speaker and topic, and it's a great free resource to get some of the best talks in the Python world or science, data science world. Uh, GitHub actually has a trending notebook um, category if you do trending notebooks, Google trending notebooks and GitHub, and you can see what the popular notebooks are right now. I know TensorFlow is one. Um, I think there's some Bayesian statistics, some visualizations. Um, again, try.jupyter.org lets you just spin up um, your own little temporary notebook server and NB Viewer lets you render your notebooks so that other people can use them and consume them. And, oh. and that's the end of what I had prepared. So thank you for being a great audience and for asking great questions. Um, best ways to get a hold of me is either tweet at me or um, at mention me on GitHub or on the Gitter channel. I am horrible with email, so I'm not even going to give you my email um, because, yeah, it's a sad thing. Um, any other questions about this Python, user groups, snow? I'm actually from San Diego, so we don't get much snow. Um, a lot of the repos are um, will have like contributor friendly or help wanted, so that would be a good place to start. Each repo should have or link to contributor documentation, how to set up a development environment. Um, probably the best thing to do is if you are interested in contributing, um, introduce yourself on the mailing list or the Gitter channel, and if there's a particular project, I know that there's. Um, many issues that could be tackled on a number of different fronts. Um, Jupyter Lab, if you use it um, in its alpha or soon to be beta state, um, feedback is always welcome there. Um, it just makes the project better when it gets to the final release. And behind you was a question. Is there best practices? Um, I'm going to let these guys jump in as well. Um, what I tend to do is when I get a new notebook, um, I will look at the import statements and see if, that's if it doesn't come with recommendations of what should already be installed. And then if it's a new notebook that I'm not familiar with, I will typically either create a conda environment 
or a virtual environment using PIP, depending on what packages um, are being used. Um, typically, I will use Conda, and then um, Conda Forge is a community-maintained um, packaging repository, and they tend to have like the latest and greatest, where um, the regular Conda channel, the default Conda channel, has a little more rigorous um, versioning, testing more for like the enterprise market. So it may lag a release, but not radically, but Conda Forge. So that would be my recommendation for best practices. Um, not ideal. Um, one of the things that we have started recommending is that in the scientific world, at the top of your notebook, um, to really document what you're using in that notebook so that it can be reproduced. And I think you could probably put some stuff in the metadata as well. Okay. More questions? Or do you want to socialize? Or raffle off the book? Raffle off the book. Let's raffle off the book. <laughs> raffle off the book. So I think we need a number between one and seven. One and seven? We only have seven new people. Online. Seven new people? Yeah, on Twitter? Okay, so a number between one and seven. Uh, what? Have Jupiter Lab do it. Uh, <laughs> no, that would then you trust my live coding skills, which is best worse than my live presentation skills. Uh, I'm going to go with three. Uh, Manu Gupta. <laughs> you are now the proud owner of O'Reilly's data analysis with open source tools. Congratulations. All right. Uh, before we break, um, yeah. next month, April 13th, we have a speaker. Do you have a mic? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I could pair it back for you. Okay. Hi. Um, so next month, April 13th, we have a new speaker. Yep. Uh, Thursday, April 13th, we have uh, one of their quants from Bloomberg coming in to talk about BQ plot, which, uh, Ooh, cool. which uh, Carol uh, brought up. And uh, who happens to actually be a U of M grad. Yeah, he was applied mathematics and yeah. then moved to the big city to be a quant, I guess. So they, uh, he reached out and uh, wanted to give a talk about uh, BQ plot. So look out for that. It's already been posted on our meetup page, just not the details yet. It's coming soon. And if anybody wants to give a talk in the future, please come ping us. Or... Yes, please yeah. do not be shy. What are you looking for? Um, what are you looking for? I, I think we're, we're looking for... I, we have a lot of tool talks. I think we're looking for some implementations of how you've used, how you've done a project or how you've done something uh, in your organization, in your institution. Um, Are any, you open? Any, any way that you're using Python and data together. Are you open to, oh, sorry. Are you open to like five minute lightning talks? Yeah. I where think people that would, that would can share good. notebooks yeah. and kind of, I know we've done that in San Diego, and it's been really fun. Yeah, I think that would, that would be a lot of fun if we had I think Ben and I uh, had thrown around the idea of having, no, lightning talks, even tutorials, or even like maybe hacking sessions or just a panel discussion. So we can change that up as we, we see what the community wants. It, and really, it, it goes back to the feedback. Uh, tell us what, you, what you, you're all thinking. And also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, sponsorship for food, if you work for a company, uh, we're working with my, uh, Midas at the university. They're, they're looking to sponsor some of, some of the uh, Food for Future events. But uh, please help us out. Oh, I forgot to do something, and I'll be in big trouble if I don't. Um, in August, JupyterCon, which is our first Jupiter conference, is going to be taking place in New York City. We would love to have you attend. We would also love to have you submit a talk proposal. And the deadline for that is March 7th. Um, so if you're working on cool applications that use Jupyter in any way, shape, or form um, that you would like to share with other people, we would love it if you would submit those ideas. Great. That's, uh, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So we can probably be in this space for maybe the next uh, 10, 15 minutes if you want to break out and do a little bit of networking.